Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 2nd, 2023. And our texts are, the thematic first reading is Jeremiah 28, 5 through 9. The semi-continuous first reading is Genesis 22, 1 through 14. The psalm is number 89, verses 1 through 4, and then 15 through 18. The epistle reading, Romans 6, 12 through 23, and from Matthew chapter 10, only three verses, 40 through 42. But before that, Caroline Lewis has a special acknowledgement to acknowledge. I do have an acknowledgement to acknowledge. Thank you for that, Matt. And it's a very exciting acknowledgement. <laughs> and that is that we received some very special emails since we were talking about uh, our gold star, we put it out there, who are some of our gold star listeners who have been listening to us since the beginning pretty continuously. And if we had a gold star like I got for perfect attendance when I was in Sunday school, these listeners would get a gold star. So we want to give a gold star shout out to Karen from Saskatchewan. So Karen, thanks for being a loyal listener these all these years. And Robert from Illinois. And thank you, Robert, for your ongoing listening and support of Sermon Brainwave. And then Kurt. And Kurt, Kurt is from... Arch of the know. The what? Round at both ends and high in the middle. <laughs> Ohio. Yes. Ohio. Kurt Ohio. in Ohio, thank you so much for being a gold star status listener here with Sermon Brainwave. So we are really grateful for those of you who reached out. Thank you, Karen, Robert, and Kurt. And thank you all for your ongoing listening to Sermon Brainwave, this podcast, as we think about these texts together week in and week out, which now we'll do. Thus endeth the acknowledgement. Mints. It's a great reminder. The more you listen, the more reward points you can earn. Right. So yes. store these up are, the, the Sermon Brainwave reward points and fill up your punch are card. Platinum medallion. Exactly. You get preferred status. seating. Hey, speaking of rewards, <laughs> oh, Matthew chapter nice. 10. Nice. Very well done. Wasn't that great? That was good. Uh, where Jesus is continuing still the missionary discourse. He's still sending out the 12. It's been a long speech before they go, and they never even actually are described as going. But here's the here's the conclusion of that, where if you remember, he's been talking quite a bit about reception or non-reception or rejection uh, and hospitality and how he wants his people to go out. And here are some uh, rather enigmatic uh, sayings at the at the very end about about uh, about welcome and reward. Yeah, and it this culmination, I think you said it really well, Matt, in terms of this being, you know, being sent out and and in particular, what is the reception? What kind of response are people, are the disciples going to get to this this new kind of kingdom, right? This new kind of reign that is very, very different from what they know uh, being a part of the Roman Empire and the way in which this kingdom of God with this reign of God really upends uh, those the, the realities in which they live. And yet there is um, there is resistance to it. And so that that's a one question we want to ask is, I think a preacher want, wants to ask is, where, when, when, and where, and why are some of those resistances, and um, and where where are those coming from? And then also, you know, it's a it's a it's a pretty simple verse, but it's a really important verse. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. I mean, I wonder how often we think about that in terms of our welcoming of others. That in doing that, we are 
we are hosting a table for Jesus. We're hosting, we're in, we're extending hospitality to the one in whom, you know, in whom we believe and trust and who we say is our Messiah and our Savior. And, and so that connection of welcome and hospitality to the very presence of Jesus puts a lot at stake there when it comes to hospitality and welcoming, I think. And it's not especially complicated. No, this is not. not, you know, there are revolutionary aspects to the gospel, but Jesus is not preaching uh, an overthrow as, as popularly understood. And, and so the marks of this new kingdom are going to be in the, in the hospitality shown to strangers and the hospitality shown to Jesus. It's not that difficult to offer a cup of cold water to a traveler. Uh, and yet that's something Jesus lifts up as, as valuable. Um, when I was in college to rebel against my family, I, I studied philosophy and one of my favorite words from studying philosophy in, in ethics is super erogation. Uh, in other words, you know, kind of acts above and beyond the call of duty, right? Extraordinary acts. And, you know, uh, there's no super erogation here, right? Nobody's called to do anything heroic. Um, at least in this verse, other verses about take up your cross are a little bit different, but at least in this case, right, that the welcome of the kingdom is as simple as everyday acts of kindness to those who need them. An interesting theme, we mentioned hospitality as a way of thinking about welcoming, and an interesting theme um, throughout scripture truly is hospitality. And uh, so this um, um, this moment of of you know, being received, and as you said, Caroline, who is receiving, uh, is um, con continuous. Uh, if we lean ourselves back to what are the acts that is truly reconciling, what are the acts that are truly justice practicing, and they are welcoming uh, others. And it begins by who is welcoming the message of God. And so welcoming the message of God extends to practices of hospitality. And it's all, it, it's actually um, capsulated in this, in this right here. I think too, the other element of this that we don't want to overlook is the, in verse 42, whoever, kept, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple and that term, little ones, emphasizing, if you will, the vulnerability of those who uh, who need to who need to receive something, um, and and who need to be welcome, and even the danger uh, that is that is being it's kind of as, you know the sort of a sub theme here, right? Of the this is a you know this is a minority group um, in in many respects going against right this <laughs> this huge empire but then at the same time as you were talking about Matt the 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 act is not over and above it's just this act of welcome which could be so easily overlooked right uh it could be it, it it's something that nobody would pay really pay attention to you to and yet is such a, an important uh important characteristic or action uh that indicates right the the presence of god and and the power of and the kind of power of god's kingdom of that welcoming of the yeah. of the the most vulnerable and so i think that's another element here too that we want to pay attention to the word that keeps coming to mind as you're speaking caroline is gesture for me uh gesture uh is a small word or, or it implies a small act, and yet it has um, enormous um, um, rep, um, repercussions. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and so these are recognizing gestures toward you, um, the gestures of being accepted, and the ge gestures of being rejected, and a recognition that that's going to happen. That you know, that both are, are where we are in this liminal sp space that we're living in right now. I think if, that's if, really helpful, Joy. 
you know, it, yeah, like that, just thinking about, and I think that's where I wanted to make a connection to like homiletically for, to help people think about it is like a gesture such as this. It's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, this huge thing, right. but this, this, a small gesture uh, and, and it, it maybe helps them realize how much they're already doing that in their lives. You know, that, that, that what those kinds of acts are, are bringing about the kingdom, even though they might not think that, or might not realize that. It's those small gestures that actually start revolutions or cultural change and social change, right? Mm. So our friend Dirk Lang has written about about prayer circles in, in communist East Germany and, and the power of, of those kinds of movements. And I think you can find this in other dramatic movements of social change that have to do with the community saying, we're going to care for, for our own, and we're going to re slowly and surely recruit more to our cause. Uh, and we're going to do that through uh, creating this community of, of, of care. I want to say one last thing, and that's just the repetition of the word reward mm. in here, which is, right. um, a theological word that Protestants like us are often allergic to, or we worry about it, uh, but it's there. And in fact, in a lot of Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks about a reward that you uh, earn, to use that word too, or accumulate. And uh, just to note that, I don't want to build a theology off of that, but I do want to to talk about how there are there are consequences to actions, consequences to negative actions, consequences to positive actions which may or may not be a cosmic balance sheet. Um, it's one way to understand it, but I think I prefer to interpret it in my, in my Protestant soul as, you know, the ways in which good behavior can form good character. Um, small holy acts can form a, a larger uh, holy character, or I'd rather say holy community uh, or a holy ethos as well. And so just to note, to note that, um, as a motivation, yes, but also as a way of thinking about, look, everybody wants to have better community or do more toward justice. But those kind of big platitudes don't change a thing, no matter how much you preach about them. But if you give people steps, right, what's the next best step? Uh, this, this passage strikes me as that kind of instruction or that kind of encouragement. Are you ready for Jeremiah? Yeah, we're going to shift, really, aren't we? Is anybody ever ready for Jeremiah? But That's what oh I was my. just about to say. <laughs> I yeah. appreciate the commentary on this one because this is one where, um, like all portions of text, we need context for this one. Um, and this one definitely needs to be set in the larger uh, context of what is going on uh, that then uh, that begins this particular reading is significant because it is in response to words that have been prophesied and spoken that are actually the opposite message that Jeremiah the prophet is giving. And how do you know when a prophet, or when the one who is to be trusted to speak truth is speaking truth when the truths are diametrically opposed? Um, so I, I, I want to begin our, our reading of this by pointing to what I think is a wonderful commentary to remind us to go be, before the text and anticipate after. Yeah, I think yeah. especially the uh, that unpacking of what prophecy really is. Yes. Uh, and and the, the expectations that really surround what prophetic speech is. And or what prophets are, particularly around you know doom and gloom and predicting dire futures. This is right from the commentary. Mm -hmm. But but uh, but no, it's it's judgment and promise because what's at stake is is the people's relationship with God, and that's what's really at stake. To be prophetic is to be connected to God, to bring God's mes message to God's people. And so that's that at the end of the day, the, that prophetic speech is for the sake of re, reconnecting or maintaining that, that relationship and that closeness to God. And I don't know how often we think about prophecy in that way. 
I really appreciate that. The words of uh, truth-telling, uh, of judgment, or forth-telling, um, anticipating the future, are what we generally think about prophecy. And I think, Caroline, uh, you've highlighted what prophecy really is. It's res- it's it's words that draw us back into relationship with God. Um, and that will tie into some of the other texts that we'll be reading t- uh, this week. Uh, but um, what does it mean as we prepare a word in the midst of trials and tribulations, in the midst of the realities uh, where we want to believe in good news? We, we, we want to uh, uh, have God show up and show out right now. And we're living in a liminal moment. It is not right now. It is not happening at this moment. And as much as we want to promise it, um, those of us who are speaking truth must be in that moment and be able to be like Jeremiah to say, God's promise of peace is there, but we're not here now. And in order to be able to receive God's promise, we have to journey where God has us along the way. And that means we have to be through this liminal space right now. I say that as a United Methodist coming off of annual conferences, as many of my colleagues are in the midst of disaffiliation. Um, our truth telling or our forth telling um, does not have to be a false promise of good, nor does it have to be an angry promise against those who disagree with us. It should be a word that brings all of us into a right relationship with God. So I thank you for that, Caroline. Just on a, a kind of a pragmatic note with this text, it's a, I think it's a hard text to relate to Matthew 10. It's one you could obviously preach all on your own if you wanted to do a kind of a deeper dive into this question of what is prophecy and how do you know when you've heard it <laughs> or how do you judge it? But if you are going to try to relate it to Matthew 10, maybe that, that idea of what does it mean to receive a prophet or to receive a prophet's reward. Um, the prophet's rewards were usually not, not so desirable. But it's it gets to the idea of what kind of prophecy do, do we reward and what kind do we spurn? And sometimes we have ears that are itching for prophecies of peace. Sometimes our ears itch for prophecies of war and conflict. And and to note how I think our how our our response to a prophetic word, whether it's in scripture or somebody who presents themselves prophetically, or in you know the prophecy that takes place in a church council meeting, um, what does that mirror back to us? Right? How does our response to it, or what we're itching to hear, also tell us something about who we are, and 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 maybe to play around with that a, a little bit? Um, it's it's an odd text because you, I think. I keep expecting Jeremiah to say it's easy to prophesy war, but uh, hard, easy to prophesy war, hard to prophesy peace. But he doesn't. He says basically both of these prophecies have to be tested uh, over time, and there's an impatience then that kicks in. So much easier if you can just believe the prophet and move on, mm-hmm. but the prophet's words need to be tested over time, mm-hmm. and as circumstances change, uh, and that's difficult for a lot of us. That's that deeply contextual piece too that the commentary exactly. writes. the commentary writes about yeah yeah well speaking of easy texts <laughs> Genesis twenty two yeah. so oh. Kierkegaard wrote an entire book about this and his tortured soul trying to make sense of it as a metaphor for faith but I'm sure we can do it in five minutes <laughs> right. Richard Middleton has written a book called Abraham's Silence. And uh, I want to just draw people's attention to that. It's a challenging read. Um, uh, All of our listeners might not agree with um, uh, his his, uh, uh, take, but the journey that he takes us on in terms of being able to read um, the long the the long lesson in um, uh, what does it mean that here Abraham is silent? Um, I found it a, a good, challenging uh, read. Um, talks about Job as well. Um, but the point that it made me think of about this text um, is uh, is beyond the text. 
So this text is the moment that, as you've mentioned, Matt, is very hard. Um, in, a, in the midst of child sacrifice, in the midst of how do the people of God not look like everybody else, Abraham immediately says, okay, God, if this is what you're going to ask, I'm just, uh, in the words of Middleton, I'm just going to silently obey. And it's like, where's the where's where's the protest this is this is a son i've waited forever for you to give us and and now you you want me to kill him like everybody else um and 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 what if we because all of these stories we read with hindsight of how the story ends what comes to mind for me is um um the idea that abraham is going to find a trust in God because God does provide here. And that becomes, as those who read the text uh, with hindsight, something that we can embrace. That when it feels like we are being led into, um, in, into the very opposite of what would be the peace, reward, and promise of God, as we've talked about in the other texts, that if we trust God, then not rushing into it. And as Abraham had done on other occasions, questioning God is okay. And then pausing and looking for that ram in the bush. Um, are we willing to accept the hard message because we trust God, not because we want to show ourselves off? Um, I'm thinking of the other texts, not because we want to preach gloom and doom because that's what the world needs to hear or because we want to preach peace because that's what we want to hear. Um, but because we belong to God and we trust God, but maybe we don't have to do it in silence. Other texts tell us that about Abraham. I think you've named it. The, 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 the text poses, the story poses the question, is this a God we can trust? Mm-hmm. And based on this story alone, I think the answer is no, or not yet. Um, mm. Although Abraham might, I'm not sure I could, right? But the larger witness of scripture is required to help put this into some kind of a context. So you, yeah. the goal of a preacher shouldn't be to make people like this passage, right. <laughs> right. Right. or to make people understand this passage, is to let them sit with the question and say, how do you answer that question? Is this a trustworthy God or not? And I, I think the other the other aspect of that that is sort of narratively enforced or under underscored is the the uh, the initial ask right of God <laughs> uh, to take your son and go sacrifice him as a burnt offering, but then you have all of this narrative space that gets to the, the, and then we finally get the act of provision right the the in, the intercession of the angel and then of course the you know the the ram but look at all that narrative space from between the ask and the provision yes and that's kind of where we all live uh that's where as that's a lot of what faith is uh and and that trusting of god is is between the ask and the provision and that's uh, that's maybe some a direction i would go uh, is it homiletically is uh, is is that is that journey and the detail and the cutting the wood and the and the conversation and how that replicates and really encapsulates that space that we live in as followers of and as believers in God and so that's yeah I get I, I, I jumped in as you were we're talking Matt and, and Caroline, you just sp sp spelled it out in terms of what does it mean to take this particular message and to linger in the, in the liminal spirit of, I'm trying to understand where I am on this journey. I'm trying to understand this God that has been trustworthy, but has never been in the timing that I want it. Um, you know, I mean, Abraham's story is a story of, you know, being called, I don't know where to, um, and then being promised, I don't know when I'm going to get it. And now being asked the most incredible sacrifice, 
This sermon, as Caroline has pointed out, may very well be the time when um, in the series of sermons that we do where the resolution doesn't come and it's okay to have it. You got to come back next week and you got to remember what I preached the week before to appreciate this particular episode. Sometimes it's in what the ninth hour or the. Uh, we have an 1159 kind of God. He yeah. doesn't come on my time, but always right on time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that wasn't that. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure we fixed anything, but yeah. No, we, we no that's not a fixing it. text, as you said. Yeah, no. Not a text to fix. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just the question. I think I think the preacher needs to figure out where's the good news here? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the, there's plenty of historical background that people need to know to help people get a better sense uh, of what religion was like in the ancient world. There's right. plenty of invitation to the mystery of God and the inscrutability of God. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta find at least some little bit of good news you can put out there, we, we, uh, we need, which is probably provision. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I like I like the question of of is God trustworthy? Because I think that's where we are right now. Our institutions have failed us. Our systems have failed us. We're naming that. And uh if I make a segue into the psalm, the psalm seems out of place right here. I mean, you know, even in the midst of the way that we've interpreted all of the text for this week, that psalm just seems too happy. Yeah. <laughs> and again, it's it's the happiness born out of hindsight. But, um, you know, as I was, as we began this first, um, receiving the news of, of my friend's death, um, you can't just jump into happy. Um, we have to be honest with the journey. And um, this is a psalm that says um, God's love is steadfast and that I will proclaim it. But I, I would encourage the preacher in setting up the service to make sure that it's done in a way that, that it's honest. If the other texts are, are, are a part of the, the service, if, if any of the other texts are going to be a part of the service, then this psalm could be out of place unless there's a lot of intentionality of crafting it in the context of the horrors and hurts that are here now. Yeah, and I think the key word for me in this psalm, given everything that we've talked about so far on this podcast, is I have made a covenant with my chosen one. And a covenant is relationship. And it's, uh, and it's, there's the promise, right? That this is an ongoing, but it's, there's give and take, there's uh, sometimes more reciprocity and mutuality than other times. Uh, but that, that commitment of God to God's covenant is, is, is the promise, but that doesn't always mean that the journey or whatever, whatever metaphor we want to use. It doesn't always mean that things are uh, instant gratification or uh, always happy and wonderful. <laughs> so that's it's the, the story of the old Testament in some ways yeah. picked up in the new that the, yeah. the, the, the answer to the question or the, the means of answering the question is this a trustworthy God mm -hmm. cannot mm -hmm. be circumstances will get better. Right, right. Right. Or we're on a steady path toward improvement. Yeah. It's God has proven faithful in the past in these ways, these covenant making ways. I mean, I think that's the refrain we see in certainly in the Old Testament. Reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say too, the way Jesus talks about the future mm -hmm. is also in, in the gospels is not about, you know, expect peace and harmony to come through your good effort. And again, this is the context of each of the texts. So not, not reading the text for the words that they say, but putting them back in their social and historical context to understand the journey that yeah. we're on to hear this truth. Yeah. 
This is one of the best parts of Romans, chapter six. <laughs> yeah. So we're con we're continuing on in our series of Romans throughout the summer. Um, and I appreciated the commentary on the website. I would turn people to that. Yes. Um, lay out some of the issues of what's at stake for Paul here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know yeah, I'll great. say this. I'll say this. Um, uh, simply because I know that there's a, a lot of questions around using language around slavery and enslaved. And um, I don't want to erase the reality um, in that context, just sort of leaning on that. Uh, that was a very clear metaphor, image, uh, reality to discuss. I, I think um, uh, the commentary uh, gives us another kind of a metaphor image that that works. But uh, I don't want to soften the fact that what Paul is saying is the transformation that um, we get uh, uh, in the Spirit's power because of Jesus is going from something horrid to something that, sh that is truly hopeful um, and beneficial. And our desire to clean up or to get away from um, uh, our 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 flawed legacy can sometimes erase the reality of just uh, how bad things were and how much we need um, to be set free, to be liberated, to be transformed, a miracle to happen, God to show up and to shift us from the situation we're in to the situation that God promises. Yeah, we, we, I think, I think I agree. The, um, what we risk losing is Paul's emphasis on sin's virulence. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. um, for Paul, sin singular is quite literally an enslaver. Mm -hmm. Um, and it deals in enslaving other people. It tries to rep, it tries to expand it. It's it's a colonizer is another kind of way of imagining it, right? It it goes places that it doesn't belong. It extracts what it wants to extract, and it replicates its its danger. It's a virus in that way. I use the word virulent. You know, I mean, it's yeah. So there's really, you know, if if the language is difficult and ugly, it's because Paul sees sin as so difficult and so ugly, and we it's hard to uh, figure out a different way of of describing it, lest we fall into thinking that sin is just simply the sum of our bad choices or our lack of education or something like that. And that may tie us back to um, the question of Jeremiah. How do we know the truthful prophet? And it's, it's, uh, it's saying a word that is hard enough for understand. How hard is this and how much we need the steadfast love of God. See how I threw in the psalm in there? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Stitching it all together.